Thank you. It's so good uh, to see you all here, and uh, I want to welcome you. Um, and just thank you for taking time to come today. It's encouraging to see how many of you are really interested in this topic of school culture. Um, we have, as you can see around the room, uh, really a, a broad spectrum of people who are education stakeholders, very interested in um, the impact of education on our youth today. So um, thank you all for coming. Um, what I'd like to do, uh, and I'd also like to um, welcome those who are here through webcasting. Um, and I want to introduce at this table here, we've got um, five people plus a sixth somewhere else in the audience that are um, actually going to be telling stories of the impact of this uh, relationship's first uh, professional development experience that they were part of in August 2012. Um, I'd like to start off by um, saying thanks to the Harris Center. It's just really nice that uh, to have you host um, this whole uh, event. It sure takes the stress off of uh, me as a presenter and um, uh, just thank you for um, you know the generosity in providing um, just all of the support and the food for today. I'd also like to thank the Faculty of Education for its um, support of my work and providing space and time to delve into the significance of school culture and uh, finally, I want to acknowledge and thank um, SHIRC, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada that funded this outreach project um, as it gave me a means for sharing and exploring more deeply um, what I had um, discovered through uh, my doctoral research. And so this session is called a synergy session. Much like our topic today, it works to develop relationships between organizations to help us not work so much in our silos. And for that reason, I'm just really thankful to see the broad spectrum of people here today. So your interest in this topic is crucial for this idea to be considered and nurtured in ways that will really benefit everyone. So our plan for today is um, to give you an overview of what restorative justice is and how it challenges us to rethink what school culture is and how it is shaped. I want to share with you details um, briefly of the two-week professional development institute called Relationships First, Implementing Restorative Justice from the Ground Up, uh, which was held in uh, August 2012 and in which 17 local educators from the Avalon Peninsula participated. And um, they're going to share some stories of impact since then. And then finally, I want to invite you um, to consider how this, how you might think this project could move forward um, if you feel that it has um, uh, credibility. So our purpose is not to say this needs to move forward, but rather in sharing it, we invite you to consider with us if it has validity, and if so, how can we move forward. So all of this, this is a lot to do in 90 minutes. So remember that you're just getting a snapshot of what was, what is, and what could be, and that this is uh, the beginning of a dialogue that I hope you will continue to participate in. So this was the description, or the first paragraph of the description of our session. Um, and I'd like to, you to just give you a moment to read through that quietly and think about what are some words that you see there that you often don't hear about in the context of education? Anybody? What would you say are some words that we often don't hear in the context of education? Just call them out. Pardon? Love. Love. Anybody else? OK. Nurturing. OK, all of, all of those, those three things, the love, the interconnectedness, the belonging, um, but also alienation and fear. We don't like to talk about how schools um, are actually fear-based for many of the people involved in them. So through this project, these concepts of um, love, belonging, trust, and interconnectedness become a priority. 
I'd like to start off with a story myself, and I want to introduce you to Andrew. Andrew is a grade 11 student in 2008 in Ontario, and he was one of seven young people who was charged with causing his school lockdown after an adult neighbor, um, suspecting they had weapons, chased him and his six friends into school shouting, those kids have weapons, immediately the school locked down. The event occurred in October. He was expelled, charged, and ordered not to communicate with his peers until the case came to court. The case came to court in May. Prior to that, um, the, the court recommended that if they were willing, they could possibly resolve this in a circle, in a restorative justice circle. So two days before his court appearance was, um, was to take place, Andrew sat with those with whom he ran that day in a circle of 35 people who had all been impacted by the event, including teachers, students, who had sat huddled in classrooms waiting for hours during the lockdown, his parents, the supporters of the others who had caused the harm, and two facilitators. For the first time in eight months, the friends who had been charged had opportunity to meet and tell their story. They each took responsibility for their role and then described the turmoil of the past months. For some, it meant missing a whole year of school. They listened as the others in the circle then shared how they had been impacted, how it had caused great fear, anger, anxiety, and frustration for their peers and for their teachers. As the stories unfolded and ended up in the middle of the circle, a sense of collective vulnerability and responsibility emerged, and together they brainstormed for ways to repair the harm done. At the end, as everyone left the circle, they came together with tears, hugs, and apologies. I sat on the outside of the circle, having been given permission to observe. At the outset, I was introduced briefly as a graduate student researching restorative justice in schools. I slipped away quietly from the group until a well-lit school parking lot, and as I walked slowly through the night air, I heard a voice behind me. Excuse me, excuse me, it was Andrew. He came specifically to talk to me. Ms. Vandering, thank you. Thank you for being here and watching. I'm glad you're researching this. Please do what you can to let people know how important restorative justice is. It has made all, all the difference. Since that time, I have been working to honor Andrew's request that came to me that night six years ago. By the time I had met Andrew, I had had several personal experiences as vice principal, teacher, and parent that had already convinced me that there was something in restorative justice that was missing in other peacemaking, conflict resolution, and cooperative learning approaches that I had been heavily engaged in till then. What was the difference that Andrew spoke of? What was the difference that I had felt? We are still in the early days of implementing restorative justice in schools and society in general. Begun in the late 90s, just a few months ago, a comprehensive research report from the U.S. on discipline disparities identified restorative justice as the most promising approach for reducing reliance on exclusionary practices and indicated authentic relationships amongst people as key to healthy school cultures. This is echoed by similar research coming out of the European Union, Australia, and Canada, where in every province, um, school, some schools are exploring and engaging with restorative justice, recognizing that there is something significantly different in what it provides. If we can identify the difference more explicitly, there is significant hope for it being more than a passing fad. And this is what's at the heart of my research. I'm digging deep into what is at its core, its significant potential, as well as what stands in the way of effective implementation and sustainability in school systems. From my doctoral research, one of the conclusions drawn was that professional development needed to include a substantive experience that allowed educators to identify and articulate their personal core values, not simply the school's core values or a policy's core, core values. From this was born Relationships First, implementing restorative justice from the ground up, a professional development experience that challenged the participants to consider how focusing on relationships first rather than individual needs and achievement 
allowed them to rethink every aspect of their lives and especially education. So to set the context, um, consider the idea of culture. What is culture? What do we mean when we talk about the culture of a society, an institution, or an organization? Well, the simplest way of describing it that I think helps is simply the way we do things around here. And that's not just in schools as to how the students do things, but how we as educators are engaged in schools and policymakers, how, how the physical structure of school impacts how we interact with each other and so on. In our current Western society, we are and have been encouraged to think of the individual, what individuals need to succeed, what students individually need to be able to become productive citizens. This is driven by a capitalist agenda shaped by wealth or a lack of it or power or a lack of power. And it's intention with an ideal understanding of democracy that encourages a collective voice and respect for all. There's a tug of war between the two, I would say. There's a tug of war between individualism and community. And an internal tug of war will get us nowhere. We need to take a stance and live from that position. We need to stop and we need to ask, what's driving us personally and collectively? What values are we really trying to instill in our youth? Where do these values come from and what do we value? Are our values truly guiding our actions? To identify the way we do things around here in the context of Newfoundland and Labrador, um, we can think about that tug of war in the context of um, all everything that's going on, but I'll just highlight a couple of things in, in, with the inclusion policy, a beautiful um, approach to thinking about how do we embrace everyone and yet we know that there's struggles in how that's actually being worked out and how educators are perceiving that and parents and students themselves. We think about uh, the revised safe and caring schools policy and I think particularly about the launch uh, um, in October when Minister Jackman said emphatically that no one should be afraid to come to school, neither adults or youth alike. And I thought the fact that we actually have to say that is really telling about what, what many people are experiencing in schools. And then the whole emphasis recently on mental health and how more and more young people we know are struggling with significant mental health issues. And then finally, um, or bullying, that comes up all the time. But when are we going to recognize that bullying is actually the giant canary in the mind, mind shaft? It's symptomatic of very foundational issues in our society today. And then finally, is there a space in our schools and in our society where we actually can talk about who are we as human beings or are we just assuming that we all think the same things about who we are as human beings. With the dispersal of the denomination school system, the denominational school system, in a sense that was taken out. Not sure that it was actually happening there either, but at least in those um, systems there was a vision about who we were as human beings. So in these things, we identify that there is a deep sense of caring and concern, but also a deep frustration as to why it is that we, we still have so many issues around this. And I would offer that restorative justice with a focus on relationships first um, is a way or offers us um, a way of taking a clear stance out of which we can um, do, do education. So then what is restorative justice? A very very, very brief history, and that is that um, it comes out of ancient and contemporary uh, indigenous and spiritual traditions, um, and it came into the contemporary Western world in the mid-70s through Mark Yancey, a Canadian in Ontario, who was a parole officer and was tired of seeing youth in courts. And one day he went to the judge and he said, look, it can, can I just please take these two youth to the farmers to hear 
the farmers' stories about the impact of the uh, vandalism on their farms. And the judge, though he says to this day he has no idea why he said yes, except for he was tired of seeing them in his court as well, he said yes. And that was the beginning of victim-offender mediation, which then progressed into a restorative justice. And um, in the judicial context, restorative justice is about circle conferences, like the one that I described Andrew was a part of. And that's where it's invitational, but those who have caused harm are invited to come into a circle meeting with those that they have harmed, and those that they have harmed um, more indirectly, along with two facilitators, and they're the supporters of those who have caused. So for for somebody who's caused harm, they can have a parent or a, a valued adult come with them. Those who have been harmed, they're not there alone. And that's what the difference is between facilitation and mediation. Mediation is often between two parties, often between the individuals or those most directly involved. Restorative justice acknowledges that we live in community and what happens to me is going to impact what happens to my spouse, my children, my colleagues, and so on. And so um, it started in the judicial context in the Western culture today, but it quickly went into schools, starting in schools um, for uh, alternative schools where youth were involved in crime. Um, so basically it's a shift in thinking from an ad adversarial approach to a restorative approach. So instead of thinking, instead of asking the questions, what rules have been broken, who did it and what do they deserve, we're asking who's been hurt, what are their needs, and what needs to be done for that harm to be repaired. Okay, it's moving from a blaming stance to a relational stance. Okay where the blaming stance says the more we punish, the less likely they will do it again, whereas the restorative approach says the stronger the relationship, the less likely we will act inappropriately towards each other. Now, um, the experience was, this experience was what Andrew was referring to, but what really happened in that circle? Um, why did it make all the difference? Now, um, I would, the difference lies in how each person in the circle was perceived. And this is the seed of restorative justice in education. So um, restorative justice lives out of three clear beliefs. First of all, that people are honored for who they are as human beings. It doesn't matter what they look like, what they sound like, what they do. It doesn't matter how serious their behavior is, but simply because they are human, they are worthy. Second belief is that human beings are relational, okay, and that we are interconnected with each other. It's less about survival of the fittest and more about knowing that we need each other. And finally, it's about how um, well-being is nurtured by one another, okay? That's how our well-being is nurtured, not by getting more and more. Okay, so when worth, interconnectedness, and well-being are diminished, restorative justice seeks to restore this fundamental understanding of who we are as human beings. So restorative justice is ultimately a philosophy of social engagement that nurtures interconnectedness, trust, belonging, and ultimately love. Okay. And by engaging with one another so that worth and connectedness of all human beings is honored at all times. Okay. So it's about moving from social control to social engagement. From rules to relationship. It's a focus on relationships instead of rules and behavior. It's a focus on people instead of policies. It's a focus on honoring instead of measuring and it's a focus on well-being instead of success. And I want to identify very clearly that this does not mean that we do not have <laughs> rules and guidelines and we don't address behavior. It does not mean that there are no policies. It does not mean that we don't use assessment or evaluation. And it does not mean that we aren't concerned about success. But each of those things then are rooted in relationship, in people, in honoring, 
and well-being. So this needs to be the foundation out of which those things come. Um, another way that I often think about this is our lenses, and those of you who know me are smiling. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> it's about um, how do we take off the lenses that we're encouraged to wear in society that measures everyone. And all you need to do is take a look at advertising. Advertising is built on the premise of making us feel like we don't belong, that we don't have what we need. Okay, and therefore we start off by measuring ourselves and then we look around us to see how our peers measure up. Okay, so it's about changing from lenses that measure one another, that box them into places, to putting on lenses that honor one another. And honor is another word we don't often use in our society today. How do we honor one another? What can we do? How can I how can I engage with you so that by the time you leave here this afternoon you will feel honored and not measured and I will feel honored and not measured. Okay, so I ask myself, well, okay, this, this is a key picture that I, I love. Um, fairness. We often talk about fairness in schools, but fairness is about measurement. It's about seeing if we have the same things. Whereas justice, in that more comprehensive sense, is about how can we each get what we need in order to function and enjoy life to the fullest? Okay. So we have um, the relationship triangle um, is one that we use in uh, restorative justice theory, and you're not getting a whole lot of restorative justice theory today, just background, but uh, it entered into schools by schools going, we need to do something about expulsions and suspensions. So like the story I told you about Andrew, that was the peak of how, how restorative justice first entered schools for the most part. But what we discovered was that students like Andrew then would return to their school cultural context where they weren't given the same kind of voice. They weren't supported in the same way. They didn't hear everybody's stories. And so they were put into a more adversarial context again. Okay, and so it was very difficult for them to hold on to what they had learned through that um, conference. And so in the restorative justice field, we've talked about how schools need to be relational. We need to think about maintaining, building relationships, and that's about how do we do that in our classrooms um, it, through check-ins, check-ups, cooperative learning, um, the curriculum, the pedagogy, the actual environment of the classroom, to maintaining relationships. When things start to go wrong, what are, um, what are we doing? And um, I was looking at this in my, in my research, and I really liked it, but I, something kept niggling at me, and I went, but why should relationships matter? Big deal. Like, why don't we make it more individualistic? What's so significant about relationships? And then I dug further into the philosophical foundations of restorative justice and discovered that ultimately it is about how we are viewing each other as human beings. Do we, in our schools, treat our youth as people, as organic, living human beings? Or are they being treated as objects, as educators? Do we feel like objects in our places of work, or do we feel like human beings? And sometimes it's a bit of both, OK? But ultimately, um, restorative justice is this whole way of thinking that impacts everything we do about uh, in education. So it is, when things go wrong, but it's also about, first of all, how do we engage as adults in that school context? And then how as adults do we engage with our youth and set up environments um, that are relational? Okay. Um, and I want to draw your attention right now to the little card that's on your uh, tables. There's, there should be enough there for everybody to have at least one. And if some of you want a few more before you leave, you can. Um, Get that, but basically, what I've shared with you right now is encapsulated on this card. Okay, the the side with the, the three questions: Am I honoring? Am I measuring? What message am I sending? Um, that's the that's the the philosophy of restorative justice. You turn the card over, and you've got a um, question framework 
um, that these are the types of questions that were asked in that circle with Andrew. Okay, everybody was given the opportunity not to answer the question, why did you do this, but to answer the question, what happened that caused you to do this, okay? And so um, this, the, the side with the three questions is kind of a reminder to say this is what restorative justice is about, and this is the more practical working out of that. And these questions can be used when things go wrong, but they can also be used in terms of how do we set up our faculty or staff meetings, you know? Um, it doesn't have to be about when things go wrong. When I am struggling with writing as a, an academic, I ask myself these questions. I go, what's happening, Dorothy? What, um, you know, what's the hardest thing for you? you know, what are you thinking and feeling? And so that question framework engages with who we are uh, as human beings. Okay, so now relationships first. This was um, the professional development experience that I designed and developed out of my uh, doctoral research. And um, what I thought about was that professional development needed to give the adults the opportunity to engage with what it meant to be human. And in the inclusion policy, one of the really interesting things is, and I don't have it right here in front of me, but it, it does address this about saying that educators need to really engage with that very same thing. The dilemma is in professional development that we're often bound by time and we jump right away from um, confronting what our thinking is about things into um, very uh, procedural ways of how do we do this. Okay, so um, what we are looking at here is um, in the way that I designed the, the professional development experience was that um, we spent a bulk of time identifying what we valued as human beings individually. We shared that with each other collectively and discovered, lo and behold, that there was about seven or eight things that we could narrow it down to that we all valued. And I have done the same kind of exercise with hundreds of people now, and it always boils down to seven or eight things. That says something about who I am as a human being. And then we took a look at how does that impact how I view myself, first of all. My relationship with myself is, all, is very important. And then how, what is my relationship like with other adults in my life. If I can figure out my relationship with myself and honor myself and honor other adults in my life and in my work context, then it'll happen naturally between myself and youth. And then I can, in an informative way, mentor youth so that they can engage with each other relationally. And then finally, how does this impact curriculum and pedagogy and then how does it impact my relationship with institutions that often I will, we often think that the institution, well, you know what, we can't do a whole lot about it, but institutions are made by people and we are the people in the institutions and therefore we can do something about the institution. This is a list of, of the participants in the group. Um, these are pseudonyms. I took this from an article that I wrote recently. But from it, you can see that there was a balance of high school, junior high, um, uh, elementary, and primary. There was a balance of gender. There was a balance of experience. There was a balance of different educational institutions. Okay, And all of those things reflect the essence of restorative justice as well. It, it, it was invitational. It opened up um, to beyond what is the dominant understanding or um, where, where most people go to school and said, you know what, there, there are independent schools that engage with youth. There are social service agencies that engage with youth. Okay, so my, my uh, purpose in selecting these people was to come up with a broad spectrum of people to see how if my approach to this professional development would actually impact um, how many of them it would actually impact. Um, it became, it became um, the, the outcome of it was far greater than I ever expected, okay? 
And I, in doing interviews a year later with the 17 participants, there was not a single participant that said it didn't change their lives in a major way and how they understood education. So before we go on and hear a few of those stories, I want to just um, identify a couple of other things. Um, first of all, how is restorative justice unique from other approaches? Some of you might be saying, well, you know what, we do this already. And I had to go through that as well, having been engaged in many different approaches. Okay, and um, what, I've come down, what it's come down to for me is that restorative justice clearly identifies and returns again and again to a view of humanity that emulates core values where all people are honored as worthy and we know that what we do impacts each other. And so when we look at what we do in schools, we need to look at all those things and ask, are we honoring or are we measuring when we implement these different approaches and programs? What message are our students getting? Then we can shape the ideas that reach for honoring and interconnectedness in these different approaches and couch them in a restorative justice philosophy that is much more explicit. Okay. Um, so in the PD experience, I used a relational pedagogy so that everyone could experience restorative justice for themselves in a teaching learning situation. We learned together who we were and what we valued individually and as a group. We learned how the philosophical framework could be implemented. We learned how to use the question framework with dealing with ourselves, other adults, curriculum, institution, the students. We explicitly learned how to listen and how to ask instead of talk. And I'm talking a lot today. Um, we learned how to learn in circles where everybody's voice was invited, heard, and valued. Okay, so what I'd like to do right now is turn um, this over to uh, let you hear some of the stories of impact <coughs> or uh, some of the participants and we're going to hear stories from the center outwards okay and um, we'll start with Kathy Conway Ward and she'll just introduce herself briefly and give us a sense of what's happened for her hi there uh, my name is Kathy Conway Ward and I'm a music teacher I teach in two elementary schools here in St. John's uh, and I was also a participant in the Relationships First Institute. Um, so my journey with restorative justice began uh, before the Institute in the winter of 2012. During this time, I was dealing with some personal struggles, and this internal conflict was affecting my teaching. Uh, as I said, I teach in two inner city schools, and many of my students come from difficult and unstable home lives. Uh, when they come to school, they are upset, angry, and often have strong reactions to situations. Prior to my introduction to RJ, I had been restore, resorting to a retributive form of justice in my classroom, rewarding good behavior and punishing bad behavior. As a laid back, easygoing person, or so I like to think, it was difficult for me to enforce punishment as I felt it was rather heavy handed and that it lost meaning after a period of time to both me and my students. Teaching in an inner city elementary school, however, could be difficult with many challenging student behaviors. I was resorting to sarcasm to maintain and sarcasm and yelling to maintain some kind of control. Emotionally, everything was beginning to catch up with me. As I started to burn out, I wonder if there was another way to reach my students. I was introduced to restorative justice in the winter of 2012. At the time, I was completing a graduate course in music education. Dr. Dorothy Vandering visited our class to discuss restorative justice. When the beliefs of RJ were presented to me, I realized I had found a way that let me relate to my students, rather than controlling or managing them. As a music teacher, I feel responsible for their artistic and personal growth so that they would grow into becoming respectful, empathetic, and accepting people. It was very ironic that I was not showing them how to grow and develop this way. As I became familiar with the practices of RJ, I wanted to learn more and more. I read everything I could get my hands on and had several conversations with Dorothy. She told me about this Relationships First Institute and suggested that I participate. The two weeks in August were incredible. 
I met 16 other like-minded educators who shared an interest in restorative justice in education. As we became deeply involved in the RJ process, I realized I needed to incorporate RJ beliefs in my music classes. I started using these general ideas in my music class, circles to check in at the beginning of each class, changing my vocabulary to dialogue with students in a more relational way, and working with students to solve problems rather than fixing our issues for them. I felt a huge change in myself and in my relationships with my students. As we started to learn more, more about each other, the relationships within the music class were strengthened. As well, I discovered that my students had had very little knowledge about me and my background. I'm an oboe player, I admit it, and I am heavily involved in several community music ensembles. However, my students had no idea what instrument I played. I mean, as part of my identity, I'm a noble player. So it was very eye-opening. So as a result, I resolved to bridge the separation between me and my students, as I believe that successful and meaningful music making needs to be created in a safe, respectful space built on trust and understanding. While my classroom environment changed, it became clearer to me that it would be an extraordinary opportunity to teach restorative values through music. Developing connections between RJ and music education has been a fulfilling experience for me, and I feel it is very important for students and teachers to understand how relationships and connections can play a very significant role in music education. <coughs> As the RJ believes and relationships are created and built between my students and I, music performance, creation, and appreciation acquires meaning and impact for all of us. Through vul vulnerability and trust, music education has the potential to create strong bonds between people. I feel that RJ has had a positive impact on my teaching, my relationships with my students, and my relationship with myself. It has been a core shaking journey that has had quite an impact and a positive effect on my life. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Peters. Uh, I teach at St. Bonaventure's College. I'm a junior high and high school social studies teacher. Um, I'll just preface my story. Um, the events that took place here happened about a month to six weeks after we had done um, the course with Dorothy. So um, we were, as a staff, in a very bad place. Superficially, things were good. Um, everyone got along, um, but underneath the surface, there were tensions. Uh, there was real anger over several issues. There have been teacher redundancies, there have been firings, and overall there was just a sense of poor communication. Uh, and finally in the fall of two, 2012, things boiled over. Um, no one was talking to one another meaningfully, and this issue, we needed to do a better job of communicating. It was as though we felt collectively we could gloss over all our problems with a smile and a, hey, how are you? Yet, there were those of us who felt we had to talk this out as a staff to decide collectively where we stood and where we wanted to go as a staff. So a staff meeting was called. Uh, at this point, we were meeting in circles. And just as we began this meeting, uh, several of the louder voices on staff immediately took over. They were interrupting each other, talking over one another. Um, you could see the direction the meeting was going to go. And looking around the circle, you could see the nonverbal communication speaking louder than anything. There were those people who were angry, they were on the edge of their seats, their faces were flushed, they were pointing. There were others who were slouched back, their arms were crossed, they were disengaged, staring at the floor off into space. And then there were others who were kind of unsure. They wanted to speak, but they didn't have that opportunity. And it was at this moment that, um, because of our training in restorative justice that I suggested that we give everyone the opportunity to speak. Um, as I said, we had done some circles before. So we had a familiarity with um, talking pieces, with peaking one at a time. But I would say the talking piece up until this point was perhaps a bit of a distraction or even a point of derision in these meetings. But all of a sudden it became crucially important because we could only speak one at a time and we had to listen. 
So we were all caught in this circle, and we were at once vulnerable and strengthened. We had an opportunity to share our views and thoughts as to the direction of the school. And in that moment, it felt a bit like we were on the edge of a void. We really didn't know what people were going to come out with uh, and where we as a staff were going to decide, or even if, as a staff, we were going to decide to go in a similar direction. Everyone had a, an opportunity to speak, um, to find their voice. And through that, we discovered commonalities. There was fear over job security, there was anger at communication issues, and a desire to be heard. We spoke one at a time for nearly two hours, and we didn't necessarily come to concrete solutions by that meeting's end. But I'm, it's fair to say we did feel closer as a staff and closer because we had found and shared similar experiences. And it's my belief that such a moment could only have come about because of our training in restorative justice and that we were honoring everyone who was present with the opportunity to speak and be heard. And that is a fairly rare commodity today. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Krista Volke. Um, I worked during this project as a vice principal. I'm currently a principal in a St. John's High School. And I'm going to be talking a little bit today about the relationship with self and the relationship with students. So just to give you context for where my journey began, um, I landed in a VP's office a few years ago. And I'm sitting there and the first student is referred to me for whatever the reason was, was actually running in the halls. And I'm looking around for the rule book. And there wasn't one. So I go next door and I say to my buddy, what am I supposed to do? What was he doing? Running in the halls. Okay, a detention, possibly two if he was yelling at the same time. So I run back in my office and I go, you have a detention. And he goes, okay. So the next person comes in, what were you doing? Well, I was doing this. I run out to my buddy, come back, you have a suspension. What? I don't need a suspension. Yeah, that's what the rule book says. It's not, it's not written here, but that's what it says. You've got a suspension. So anyway, I was doing this for a few months. And I was thinking, I don't know if I can do this for the next number of years. Because it felt to me like I was on this treadmill. And really, anybody could do my job once you memorize that, you know, <laughs> list of whatever. Because after a while, I started learning. didn't have to go to my buddy next door so much anymore. Thank God he was there. Um, so anyway, I was experiencing some deep uh, dissatisfaction. And uh, we were looking at forming an after-school study group uh, for some different ways of working with students. And we came across Dorothy, or Dorothy came across us, however you want to look at, and she took us on as a project. And uh, she was working with our school as a, we had a, a number of teachers on staff who were trying to find alternative ways to work with students. And it evolved into a weekly meeting or bi-weekly meeting where we really sat down and hammered away at what restorative justice was, how should we connect with each other, and so on. One of the messages that I like to share when I talk about RJ is that it's not a program. You can't really be trained in it. It is life-changing, professionally and personally. Um, you can sit down, you can go to a course, um, you can go and do this intensive two-week training session or education ses session, but it, it, it takes over the way you see the world, it takes over the way you connect with other people, it, can, it takes over the way you connect with yourself. Dorothy referenced those questions that she does the self-talk with, you know, what am I thinking? What's the hardest thing for me? That that on all those questions on your cards there. That is really the crux of it in terms of how we communicate with students now. In my school, when a student comes in, those questions are the first thing that comes off. We don't ask why anymore. We ask, you know, what's happening? And when a student has a chance to talk and gets to say what the hardest thing for him or her is, we really get to know those students. And I don't feel like I'm manipulating them anymore. Like I feel like we have a relationship, that we trust each other, as opposed to me saying thou shalt. It's more of a guide and side kind of thing. It actually includes, in my opinion, more of a DI and inclusionary approach. Because instead of going to that rule book and saying you ran in the halls, therefore you got to do this, it's now what was going on, 
what were you thinking, how were you feeling, who was harmed, all these key questions, and then we come to a decision about how we're going to repair the harm together. Um, a little anecdote, I've got a bunch of these, I won't go down all of them, but um, the other day, small, small, small example, but it goes back to that triangle Dorothy referenced earlier about the proactive in the building piece. I was writing my message for the graduating class this year for the program, you know, the good luck message and congratulations message that you have in those programs every year. So I did it up and I was bringing it out to my school secretary to say, here you go, you can put it in the program now. And there was a bunch of young ladies hovering around the counter, you know, what are you wearing? And who's going? And one of the girls said to me, are you going to go to the prom? Are you all ready? And I said, funny you should ask, I just wrote my message. She said, oh, cool. I said, do you want to look at it? She said, yeah, I'd like to see it. I said, okay, come over and tell me what you think. So we go, we go over and we sit down at my desk and, and she said, yeah, it's good. I said, come on now. <laughs> she said, I don't think it's inclusive. And I went, okay. She said, that part right here where you're talking about how all your dreams and goals are time, you know, you can come through now and you can start enacting them and moving things along. She said, we all don't have dreams and goals yet that we know about. I said, okay, fair point. I was trying to be inclusive, but obviously I missed the mark on that. So we took that sentence or two and we said, uh, I forget exactly how we worded it now, but we said, for those of you who have your goals already in place, you know, good luck with moving them on through. For those of you who may not have them yet, take the time you need, or whatever we said. But it was, I would have put it out there, never knowing that some kids would read that and go, that's not me, right? So it's being proactive. It's also having those conference circles that Dorothy referenced as well when you have an incident in your school. It's about a young man, another young man I work with quite closely. Didn't think I was getting anywhere with all this RJ stuff, but I kept going. And um, anyway, one day I was out in the parking lot a couple of years ago, and uh, I was engaging with these two or three very, very defiant students. It was just me and these kids. And he came out and he said to the young men and women who were being defiant, don't be treating Miss Bogey like that. She deserves better than that. She treats you with respect. You can do better for her. And I went, first of all, I was thinking, please don't hit him. <laughs> you can go on inside now. Um, but then afterwards, I went and I called his mother. And she cried because it was so meaningful for her. And like so sometimes the RJ is not a, a readily apparent, but it comes through. It changes who you are. You can't go back. And sometimes you slip back. Like there's days when I'm having a rough day and I'll say, okay, you swore it, so and so, you gotta go home, and that's it. But then when you have that conversation, because you had to have the conversation after, you get at the questions then. And you find out what was going on with that young person. How are they feeling? And what can we do to help them move on to the place they were, to the place they need to go? I'm going to finish off now because I can talk at this for a long time. I got the gift to gab. But I just got back from a conference. And I was so excited about this. I said, Dorothy, i got to put this in. Uh, it was a conference about brain and learning and intelligence and defining intelligence. And most of us in the room, if you're educators, we often look at intelligence-based testing, IQ tests, to determine how strong a person is intellectually. Well, this gentleman, who's a psychologist at New York University, his name is Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman, is changing the way he looks at intelligence or defining intelligence. And he's created what he's called an imagination network. And the imagination network is essential for student success and achievement. And I'm going to have to read this to you so I don't miss it. But basically, what he says intelligence is, from his definition, is the following. The imagination network is associated with mind wandering, daydreaming, imagining and planning future, self-awareness, retrieval of deeply personal memories, evaluation of social and emotional implication of another person's situation, monitoring one's emotional state, reflective consideration of meaning of experiences, mentally stimulating the perspective of another person, reflective compassion, reading fiction, and reasoning about moral dilemmas. And when I heard him say that, I got the cold chills, because to me this is RJ. 
completely and utterly our, our day. So I think if, depending on where his research takes us, we could be looking at our day as a tool for testing intelligence later on. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Roxanne Skeins and I was in the capacity of a vice principal there last year and when we did the training with uh, Dorothy and uh, I continue to uh, go forth with my restorative justice and relationships first program even in my classroom situation this year. However, I'm going to be dealing with the amongst students because I'm moving on from Krista because Krista's stories are very similar to my uh, year last year and I will be referring to a story that happened in my uh, uh, capacity as a vice principal last year in a primary school, kindergarten grade three. And uh, I, I just want to reference that, uh, again, a lot of our restorative justice things are, are it's innate, it's in, in the children already. It's just getting it out of them. And I'll just give you an example of one uh, story that I have from last year. I have many stories I have because from my first day that I arrived at this new school as the new vice principal, uh, no idea, no preconceptions of anybody in the whole entire school between staff, students, or, or parents. Uh, I thought after just finishing up my training with Dorothy during that summer, that now there's a great opening now to go right in on the first day, and I did start on first day being the disciplinarian that uh, I was uh, given the job to do, responsible for all discipline in the school. I started right on opening day. And uh, I started with circles within my office or out in the corridor. I, I had conversations with the children. Uh, and I, like I said, I had no preconceived ideas of any of them. So I came to them just new and fresh. And I found throughout my first course that I, it, was, it was calming. It was very calming. It caused me to think and go through those questions with them. So I'll give you an example of just one that happened. And I think it was about last, uh, last year, about early spring, probably about April. And this is after now about six or seven months of the students used to my conferencing with them in chats. I have chats, caring, I call them calm, harm awareness talks today. That's my uh, 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 quote that I use. I had a poster on my wall with it. And they, they've they come to the term that chats, they have to have a chat with me. Where they're going to have a chat about harming. So uh, this happened about uh, last, like I said, late or early uh, spring. And the children were... A couple of the girls that were involved in this and, and the boy, they had already been in my office for circle chats about harm that had been already previously done by them or done to them. And uh, this was a, one of the girls had come to me in the corridor one day, grade three, telling me about this boy who had uh, been bothering her, pulling on her ponytail, being very belligerent to her, not being nice to her, being mean. And she wondered if she could have a chat with me. And I said, caring, you know, calm, harm awareness talk. Oh, yes, miss, I need to have a chat with you about what's going on. I said, okay, no problem. So I chatted with her first. She brought along her supporter. She had a girlfriend that wanted to come with her, which is acceptable, to come in and, and, and she was a witness to some of the events that were going on with her and the little boy. Now, the boy, in this case, was a grade two student. So this is grade three girls coming to me about an issue with a grade two boy. So, of course, uh, they sat down with me in my office. I did a pre-conference pre, uh, with them. And we chatted about, okay, what, was, what, what happened and what was going through your mind. We did the five questions again. And, you know, so what's, who's been affected mostly by this? And we discussed all that out. Now, what are we going to do to, you know, to move things on and put things right? And they suggested, well, miss, can we talk to him? No problem. Let's do that. So we set up a time. We had him come in. And the four of us sat down in my office in circle. I always had enough chairs there that the four of us would, or how many were in there, would sit down. And we started in the conversation. Of course, we started with the harmers. And the people, not the harmers, the, the girl that was harmed. And uh, she started, you know, and we uh, talked about what was going on. She started by saying, you know, he had been pulling on her hair, uh, you know, doing all those nasty things to her. Her supporter then got to speak and agreed with her and said, yes, miss, I saw, or, you know, yes, I saw you doing this to her. And as the conversation is going on, uh, you know, and they're telling him how they felt and both of them how they felt, He's watching all of this, and he's waiting for his chance. He wanted to speak, but I, you know, we always say in circle, everybody's going to get a turn. You know, your turn will come. So his time came to speak, and when he spoke, he admitted right away, you know, to to doing this to the girl. 
But when we asked him, or when I asked him, okay, well, what was going through your mind at the time? He admitted, almost teary-eyed, this is a grade two boy now, almost teary-eyed, well, miss, I see her all the time with all her friends. I just want her to be my friend. And it brings tears to my eyes now, just thinking about, here are this accolation. It came out right there. Now, he's been in a couple of circles with me before because of issues. He's been bullying and doing things like that with other kids before. So he knows he's, he's in that trusting relationship now where he knows he can open up and say what he feels and how he is. So, of course, we got continuing on through the discussion with that. And uh, so I got to the girls and wanted to find out now, okay, well, what do we need to go on from here? Because we now know that he's upset. He, he knows that he's after, you know, making you feel scared because she did say that she was frightened. She was uh, a little, she felt like uh, uncomfortable around him. She'd get on the bus with him. He'd always want to be sitting with her and she'd be wanting to sit away from him because he was pulling on her hair and saying mean things. So through the jigs and the reels and, and he recognized that they were being harmed by what he was doing. She, you know, we said, well, what do we need now to do things right, to get things to go on from here and to be friends and to be able to live in our school together and on the bus together? And it was unbeknownst to us, but she brought up then about, well, Miss, you know, first of all, i got to bring up about another incident that I've seen him at home on his quad speeding on by my mom's daycare. And I'm really scared that he's going to hurt one of my, you know, mom's got little kids that are out there, and I'm really concerned about him because he's doing this too. You know, so all of this is coming out, the connection with school, going on there at home, in the community. And so they brought this up to his attention. And he, we asked him again, well, what were you thinking at the time to be doing that? Well, I'm only trying to keep up with my dad. So here he is, he's trying, to, and he was honest about it. Like, well, I was trying to keep up my dad. He's going down the track so fast, and I'm trying to keep up with him so I don't lose sight of him. So here we're having a discussion about that. And in the part here where it's among students, I started at this point to become the facilitator. I just sat back. I folded my arms more or less, not really, but, you know, and I just watched the conversation going on, continuing between the three of them. One would say, well, you know, that's not very safe. You know, you could, one of the little ones could run out and you could run them over and get hurt. Oh, I didn't realize that, and, but I'm only trying to keep up with Dad, but I'll have to tell Dad this. So here's all this conversation going on in front of me. And uh, so then when they finally had that all hashed out and said, okay, well, you know, what are we going to do now? How are we going to address all the needs that are here between all the issues you're talking about? And one of them suggested that they, well, why don't we try to play together? Like, I'm still sitting back just watching how this is unfolding in front of me. And, you know, let's, well, why don't we play together lunchtime? Okay, well, then that might be a good start, don't you agree? And I, you know, when I'm going on the conversation here, and I said, okay, so why don't we try something for tomorrow? Why don't we try something tomorrow? And one and the little fella jumped up and he said, "Well, we can play tag tomorrow. Why don't we go out and play tag on the lunch room when we're out for playground time?" Okay. And you know, we reviewed the decisions that the girls made and the guys made, and we said, "Okay, in a week I'll check back and see how things are going." And within that week, there were conversations were going on, and they were still going down. And to this day, I know that those one of the students are still in my school, still using those circle chats and trust. So it works from there. Thank you. Hello, my name is David Martino. I work at an independent school here in St. John's. And I'm going to speak to you about curriculum and pedagogy. And I guess I'll frame this by uh, telling you a little bit about why I started to think about the ways that I could relate restorative approaches with curriculum and pedagogy. And th that stems largely from a, a, an observation that I would make in classes. I'm a high school English teacher, by the way. And this year, I was lucky enough to also be given two slots of careers, uh, which is an interesting course. And I'll tell you more about that after. Um, in any case, we'd have classroom chats. And oftentimes, students would really, you know, they were, they were hitting their speaking and listening strands, I suppose, because they were speaking and appearing to listen. But if you were to examine the degree of listening by the degree of responding to another person, uh, you know, you'd, you'd begin to question what was involved in their version of listening. And again, listening is not an easy term to begin with, so it's something that I just felt you know, we weren't doing enough with. So that was one, uh, I guess, framing 
thing. The other was uh, seeing students in class uh, disengaged. So we'd be talking about something, and there'd be you know, students over there in the corner or whatever, off looking, uh, listening, talking to their peers. And I started to you know, think about where those stu students were when they weren't with me and the lessons that we were supposedly working with together. And I realized in, in chatting with students that oftentimes they thought of where they were in that moment as somewhere totally outside of the curriculum. Uh, and outside of really the school experience as a whole. School meant something for them, and the lesson of that classroom meant something for them. And when they could just chat with each other and be out of that, they were gone. They were somewhere else. So what I started with was uh, uh, an adjustment to their notebooks. I required them to structure their notebooks in a particular way. And they had to have a, a note section and, and some other things, a vocabulary section, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And one of the things I wanted was a little space kept at the bottom of each page. And if students, I encouraged students, I invited them, should they feel inclined to go somewhere else, other than focusing on you know, what we were talking about together, um, if they wouldn't mind maybe jotting down some of their thoughts there, maybe doing some mapping so they could doodle, they could draw, they could do whatever they wanted. And the idea was that uh, self-reflection, that strand within the English curriculum, uh, often is just given or assigned to like a quote. You know, Here's a quote from Gandhi. What do you reflect on it? What do you think? So I decided to suggest that maybe they, at some point, look back through their notebook and look at the different times that they weren't doing English class and see if they could recognize patterns. You know, whenever we talk about this, I'm somewhere else. Or these are the things that I think about or I imagine about, I you know, daydream about or whatnot. And maybe if we were talking about something, if they had a reaction, an affective, an emotional reaction to something we're talking about, maybe they could also put that down there too. And I started to open up, you know, what could go in that space? And really the possibilities were only deter were determined by the student. And I suggested that at some point when they had to do reflections, maybe the reflections could respond to what was in those spaces. And even if there was nothing in the spaces, maybe that could also be something to reflect on as well. So while that's not really immediately sort of or obviously tied to circles, et cetera, et cetera, when we invite students into a circle and we invite them to respond to the question, you know, how did that make you feel, we're kind of supposing that they can recognize and name what they can feel. But I think part of where the curriculum has to meet restorative approaches is in helping to foster the ability to recognize feeling, to speak about that, to name it, to feel trust with that relationship, etc. Uh, the other uh, thing that I want to talk about uh, how students in discussions very seldom listen to each other. So in, in this story, I tried to use the circle as a form and a content uh, in terms of hitting the critical thinking and listening uh, strands within the curriculum again. And in this story, I'll talk to you a bit about careers. The careers class, uh, for any of you who don't know it, is, is a wonderful thing. Um, the first two pages of the textbook define careers, and it's a really interesting definition because it basically suggests that everything you will ever do in your entire life is part of career. Uh, and so career is not just the job, it's all the experiences, the hit and misses, the this and the that, that tie into the job. But if you notice, it works backwards from the job, right? And so at the beginning of the year, I didn't name that for the students, but we started with just the question, you know, what, what is this definition of careers suggesting to you? And, and what do you think this course is about? And I had always intended to kind of go back periodically to reflect on that question together. Uh, anyways, in, in the January, I took parental leave. I was gone for a few months. Last week was my first week back. So I get back into the class, and I say, OK, well, let's have a check-in circle. So we have a check-in circle. I said, so, well, where are you guys now? You know, what is this course about now? And we were on the second speaker in the circle, and he said, you know, I feel really weird about this course because I feel like it's, it's kind of what it wants me to be. I said, well, what do you mean? And, well, it wants me to be competitive, and I'm supposed to look at all my peers, everybody that's sitting next to me as a potential competitor, ultimately, for this job that I have to get. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is brilliant. Okay, uh, so we, you know, he spoke, he, he said his piece, and we kind of went around, and it sort of didn't get picked up on that much. A few people commented a little bit on it. So what I did is the next day, came back in, and I showed them a, an excerpt from a film. It's called, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of a funny story, that's the name of the film. And there's a scene in this film of a young 16-year-old uh, boy. He ends up 
um, checking himself in to a psych ward. Um, and it largely has to do with the stresses and the depression that he feels, which are connected to his schooling experience and what he's supposed to be through school. And I, I introduced the video clip because I felt that with, with students and with lots of people, um, oftentimes it's easier to think about things, to imagine something that is a little more distant from us. So we can have a, we can have a connection to it, a similarity to it in its storyline, but we can name the story if it's out there, if it's in film, if it's in a book. I mean, study literature, et cetera, et cetera. So we watch this clip, and we put ourselves into the circle. And I like to start in the classroom space, and then we all put the classroom into a circle, sort of as a, uh, an intentional gesture, I guess. Um, and what we did is we took two talking pieces. And this is something that, was, that happened at the the RJ two-week seminar thing. So we just we had broken up into two circles, and when we came back to discuss what had happened, one of the groups said, "Well, we did. We we felt like the circle was kind of limiting, so we introduced this second talking piece." And Dorothy was like, "That's fantastic!" And everybody's like, "That's so interesting!" And so I decided to experiment with that in the classroom, and I used a loony and a toony, and I thought those were very fitting talking pieces. Ironic, but fitting. And so. The first one was the, the topic, was the idea that we were going to try to uh, construct arguments about or talk about. And then the second talking piece would go around, and that would be the response to the student-generated idea, or, or, or first point. Okay? And so as we went around, we were using the questions here as our guide. So what happened you know, to him, to the, the character in the movie, but also, hopefully, to us, to you, like when you're in this careers class and you're thinking about school and, and all of these experiences, get that critical thinking going, how are you positioned within this textbook and all this stuff? The other one, and I like to kind of flip the order sometimes, was what, what do you feel about this? And then from the feeling, what do you think about it? And so we did a couple of rounds around this circle, um, and a lot of really interesting things were said. Um, People talked about, uh, they talked about competition, talked about uh, the stresses of family life, whose objectives they were living out. Uh, one student mentioned capitalism, which I thought was fantastic. And again, it's sort of, it was for them to take up and sort of engage as, as it felt right in that circle, but it was something I could come back to in a later story. So that was, uh, that's my story. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Gary Hunter, uh, and I too was part of that uh, two-week seminar. Uh, and myself and one of my coworkers, uh, we were two uh, teachers who were not with the school system or an independent school, so we work at a community organization. And uh, just a quick background before I go into my spiel with the institution, uh, I work with 12 to 16-year-olds who are at risk or who have already dropped out of school. And so a big, a big part of uh, my role is uh, connecting with different uh, schools, especially at the beginning of the program, uh, to try to build up those relationships, try to build up uh, our our youth. Uh, so we have a full program, of course. Uh, so what I'm just going to quickly talk about, quickly talk about, is uh, with the institution and specifically with one school um, in particular. And so uh, one of the schools that are really close to our our building uh, is. Um, I feel like nobody's mentioned the school they work at. Is that all right? Okay, uh, is uh, a booth memorial, um, and it's just the way it, it worked out. Um, is that a lot of our, uh, the youth that I see, a lot of the youth that I teach, uh, also attend uh, uh, that high school, and so uh, it's it's been a place where we've really had to focus and, and build that connection with. And so uh, I've been really fortunate where I've been able to work really closely with uh, Krista, uh, who spoke earlier, um, and, and just building up that uh, relationship with. With not only the, the the youth that we see, but also with with the teachers, uh, with the administration, uh, everybody involved, uh, and I guess I guess the big part of this is that um, being able to keep that relationship going between uh, myself and my coworkers and the school uh, has been able has been so beneficial for the young people because um, they see us interacting with with the school, and uh, we have an opportunity where we can really uh, build a strong relationship with these young people in a different context. And so uh, we get to know them from a different light, I guess. Uh, they, they come in, they tell us their stories, uh, things that they might have never uh, shared with teachers or, 
or the principal or the guidance counselor, uh, and it's really powerful. Uh, but then when they see us come up uh, to the high school and then we're interacting with the, the teachers and the administration, uh, it, I feel like something really clicks for them. Um, and just uh, a, a quick, I remember sitting in uh, uh, Krista's office and one of our students was in there and he was having a real difficult day. And it, it was a really unique and uh, an awesome experience to be able to sit in that room and, uh, and work together like between uh, where I work in, in, in Booth and, and, and kind of hash out uh, good plans uh, of action for this student. And, uh, and just last week, this, this same student who struggled like coming in and out of school, uh, like you know, reduced schedules and all kinds of uh, uh, like hard hard times. He comes running down and it's his lunch time and he's like, "All right, I'm on my lunch break and I need to get some more work done." And we had had like a file working at our at our office that he's just been kind of working on slowly. And he really all he wanted to do was get that work done. And he was just, I'm like, floored. Like this this uh, young person doesn't want to go to school half half the days and and he's willing to come down after uh, during his lunch period to do some work. And so really speaks highly of that uh, connection, but um, just, uh, I guess a few weeks ago now, um, Krista invited myself and a co-worker to come and uh, do a, a little introduction to restorative justice in, uh, I keep on wanting to call it a day resilience, and I know it's not called that. Ah, I knew it was that. Uh, so it came to introduce restorative justice in the circles uh, in the day of resilience, uh, and it was such a phenomenal experience, and uh, all the students and the staff uh, they seem to really uh, grab, uh, gravitate towards it, and, and even just uh, I think it was Friday, I'd uh, popped into the school, and uh, this was a few weeks, maybe even a month ago, that it happened, and they're like, "Hey, I know you, I know you, you're that circle guy," and, and it was like, it was like, "Oh, that's really cool. It's just, uh, it's really nice, and it's been a fantastic experience to be able to uh, build that relationship up with uh, 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 Booth, um, and it's not just Booth, of course. It's been uh, very beneficial in the in the two week seminar." In general, has helped uh, like kind of uh, help me reflect more on uh, my relationships with the schools and work together uh, to help out these uh, young people. All good. <laughs> Sorry, the, the organization that I do work at is is uh, Thrive, uh, and I specifically work within the Rogers Breakthrough Project. Uh, and there are a couple of people back there who I work with uh, that are hiding in the back, and they said they were going to heckle me, and I, they haven't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, once you start telling stories, and how do you how do you compress all of this in you know an hour, hour and a half, and um, this is shorter time for discussion than we had hoped for, but at least we've got about 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes to uh, let you ask some questions. Um, but I hope that through the stories you've got a sense of the comprehensiveness of how restorative justice can actually make a difference in schools. So our, our question really for today, um, well first of all, we realize that there is lots of potential, that working from the ground up is really important rather than coming from the top down. Um, that there's lots and lots of people who are interested in this and are asking questions and we're looking for ways forward. How do we make this go forward. So those are some of the things that we want to just open up for you at this point, but hope to continue dialogue in the future as well. So just some questions or comments.